still well. thinking of concentration camps, which is a different thing altogether. Oh, wow, well, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It was I I Italian ones, German ones. Uh, and uh, some of the Germans used to carve model aeroplanes and sell them to local people who bought them for their kids at, uh, at Christmas. So I can actually remember having a, a, a wooden model of, I don't know what, what model of aeroplane it was, but it had got British circles, red, white and blue on the, on the side of it. Um, well, I must have done. Uh, my only encounter then was my very first encounter with prejudice, which was understandable prejudice. Um, they were they were used as uh, to dig up to dig up roads, doing road repairs, and they were digging a trench in front of my house in Mosley Road, uh, Bilston, and. Uh, I was out there playing in the streets, I mean there weren't very very few cars around in those days <clears throat> and, uh, and one of them picked me up yeah there's me looking in the trench looking at what adults were doing picked me up put me in there and all of a sudden this hurricane in the shape of my mother come hurtling down the drive grabbed me up and said you mustn't go there why they're Germans. Well, I must have been four years of age. I wouldn't have understood what that, under, understood what that meant, it to, meant at all. Yeah. I, I, I know it was somewhere around there. I don't, I don't know oh, exactly where it was. Okay. Yeah. Well, I was actually born in Darlington, but I've no recollection of of, of, of Darlston. Um, my earliest recollections were of Motley Road in Bilston, which I actually think is Willinghall, okay. but it had a Bilston postal address. Uh, <coughs> then, uh, then I moved it into the Lunt area of, of Bilston until I was uh, just turned 12, and then I came to Bentley. <clears throat> which at, at that time was a part of Darlaston okay. when when Darlaston was a separate town which is now it's of course it's a part of Walsall well I, 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 I don't know if it's some kind of a a pointer towards the way that my rest of my life uh, would, would, would become but I can remember uh, my headmaster, Mr. Barry, he was a, a Yorkshire man who had been a, a pilot trainer during the war. He was uh, an otherwise good teacher. His, his classes were always very interesting. And I can remember two things that he said. He said that the reason that Jews were rich, because it says in the Bible it should be harder for a rich man to go to heaven than a camel to, to pass through the eye of a needle. So, Jews were rich because they weren't going to go to heaven. <laughs> now, well, that he didn't say that, but that was the implication. And another thing he said was that the children of uh, mixed race pa parents show the worst characteristics of their respective parents' races. Okay, <laughs> interesting for him to say that to yeah, you. <laughs> yeah, that would be around about 1954, 55. Yeah. just registered as not really making sense. I didn't actually think about it, but the fact that the, both of these two occasions stuck in my mind must have been that I had some thoughts about it, like, you know, it's, uh, it doesn't make sense. It was, a, it was a Catholic school, a very small school. There were five classes from uh, five until the age of 15 when we left. Um, the headmaster, Mr. Barry, as I said, was a Yorkshire man, but Barry is actually an Irish name, and the other teachers were four women, all of whom were Irish. 
Um, one was from Ulster, the others from the, was from the south, from the Republic of Ireland. Yeah, yeah. Um, I can remember when Mrs. Dalton, whose, whose son is now, I believe, a solicitor, said that uh, uh, our Protestant brethren may be sincere, but they're wrong. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's, um, yeah. So I had the I had the history of Ireland <laughs> up to here. <laughs> Uh, uh, that's uh, that's good. Uh, that's cool. Father drummed that into me, although his father was actually English as well. Yeah, yeah. Okay. My great my great grandfather was Irish. On my father's side, uh, to um, my great great grandfather, who was. Uh, I think he. Di I think he was. He died in 1869, and was buried in a in a mass grave in Dublin. So when I found this out, I, I googled. I think it was 1869. Could have been a 67. Uh, plague Dublin, and sure enough, there was a cholera plague. I took him, and there was also a daughter from the same family. Who was, I think was about seven years of age. Was also buried in. The, a mass, a mass grave, but my no idea if these stories are actually true. But uh, I found out that uh, that uh, my great great grandfather was a, a leather tanner. He tanned leather. He was rather fond of the drink, and uh, the family story is that he would save up his money for three years being totally teetotal and then he would disappear for six months <laughs> until he spent it all on drink and then start all over again. I've no idea if this story is true but and that's what I heard and but on my mother's side I trace it just back to uh, great grandparents it was uh, the surname was Lavi. who was also Irish and I had a somewhere around a copy of uh, my grandmother's birth certificate in which both of her parents signed the birth certificate with the cross okay, because, so really they, because they couldn't they couldn't read or write yeah um, um, my first job was work, working in a laboratory in the paint shop still works in the in Wensbury. Uh, usually that type of apprenticeship would be taken up by somebody who had been to grammar school, which I hadn't, and I put it down probably to my the influence of uh, my father's sister's husband, my uncle Chris, who was the chief buyer at the patent shaft. However, there I became interested in being a teddy boy and uh, I, I decided to get a job working generally as a, a plumber's assistant for a, a, for a builder and a Jude in Darleston because it, it paid more money. I could buy my own clothes. <laughs> okay. And I can remember the first, oh yeah, before that I can remember, um, I worked as a, um, a grocery boy in, in Darleston, riding one of those bikes with a, a big basket on the front. And I used to get tips, you know, actually I was better off when I was at school as a grocery boy than the, I actually started work. But I earned one pound eight shillings a week. Wow, a big spender. Yeah. <laughs> no, that was that was when I started work. Um, uh, and I can I can remember 
I bought a black shirt, which to me was a black shirt. When my mother saw it, of course, I had no idea that it was associated with a black shirt. Fashion to my mother was a black shirt, a black shirt, oh my god, a black shirt. <laughs> well, my mum's generation would have been, okay. you know, because they were there during the war. Okay. The, the Black Church, the Mosley's clan, yeah, and there were riots in the street in, in London fighting between the Black yeah. Church and, uh, and other people. My dad was quite, he just a passion, <laughs> you know, my dad was cool with it, yeah. And I started as I had various jobs. Uh, for, first of all, I was a bus driver and I decided I wanted to go for the, the lorries. Um, I, I, I started off, uh, where was it? I can't remember the name of the firm now, well in all. Um, they used to do a lot of Scottish, Scottish work. Uh, I passed my test as a class one HGV driver, and I reckon it must have been about eighteen months before I could actually reverse and hearted lorry properly. Yeah, um, it was a, a lot of hard work, like you know what I mean. Uh, because when you when you go to um, the driving school, they teach you how to drive. They don't teach you how to load. Okay. So, so uh, when I got my first job, they wouldn't trust me with an Arctic at first. They put me on rigid lollies and the boss said to me, do you know how to do a dolly? Now, what's a dolly? And it's a particular type of knot uh, that lorry drivers use. It's a sliding knot so that you can Tight things it. down, tie things down tight. So you got a piece of rope, showed me how to do a dolly. There you are, off you go. And that was it. And I can remember being up in Scotland one time and uh, I had a load of empty 40 gallon drums. And I think I was a mile out of where I'd loaded from before they started moving on the back. Then pulling, I'm standing at the side of the road there wondering what the hell to do. This, this, this load which is not going to stay there before I get back to England, it's up in Scotland and a colleague from the same company pulled up and showed me how to do it um, by pulling the sheet the, the sheet over the, over the load and then roping in between the actual um, drums so it was the sheet it was holding everything down like you know what I mean yeah <laughs> you live and learn seven years well quite a lot of my storage <laughs> when I worked uh, I did 14 minutes uh, going from here to Europe used to do France Italy Belgium Holland Germany and Austria it was just uh, France, Italy and Austria that I was actually doing deliveries, but these other countries I had to go to to, uh, to get there. Um, I remember the very first trip I did and uh, I got to the, the bottom of, um, I was going to Italy, got to the bottom of Mont Blanc and there was a sign that said, Change Obligataire. I hadn't got any uh, these are chains that when you've got snowy or icy weather you put chains around the, uh, around the, uh, the, the driving wheels of the Arctic, Arctic unit and I hadn't got any chains and they, they were these um, this is, they were a French customs police at the bottom of Mont Blanc because you go up Mont Blanc through a tunnel seven and a half miles long it brings you out into Italy so chains obligatory. So I sort of made physical gestures to say, I have no chains. And it's, Ale, Ale, <laughs> waved me on. And it was in a blizzard. 
and when I got to, when I got through the tunnel in, into Italy, it was it was actually clear and dry on the other side, and the snow plows had been around and shoved all the, the snow into big drifts at the, at the side of the compound where you parked. Um, and I bought a bottle of wine from a shop <laughs> where you do your customs, stuck it out the window into a snow drift, had something to eat, <laughs> pulled the bottle out there, pulled myself, myself and my girlfriend at the John Claudette and drank some wine. And all I could see when I um, when I went to sleep was snow coming to snow snow coming towards me. Yeah, <laughs> I'm I'm pretty good I'm pretty good with accents. And mm. um, my dad was as well. He could do Scottish and Irish Irish accents, and and so can I. But when I hear little, well, as you travel in different countries, you pick up little phrases. Uh, that you find useful and because I get the accents right um, they actually think I speak and understand more than I actually do <laughs> so then I have to try to tell them sorry I don't understand but uh, one time I did a rush job between uh, Christmas and, and New Year and I left Kufstein and the